So welcome to the ODR, the State of the Art Symposium. We know it's a very dynamic area, so the state of the art is as of now, uh, but no doubt when um, the Sazelman Cowan Center runs this again in another year or two, uh, then um, the landscape will have changed dramatically already. The format of the symposium, it's going to be all panels and all interactive. Uh, we have fantastic speakers, but they're not going to speak. Uh, they're largely going to engage in discussion and interaction with you. So please ask questions. We will have some handheld mics, but we'd much prefer, it worked very well last night, uh, if you use the Slido mechanism and ask questions, they will appear on the screen and then they're ranked according to the support that they have. I think that's the best, um, best and most efficient way of getting um, the most popular, most concerning questions up there. Uh, we have a tour, I'll introduce the speakers in a moment or let them introduce themselves. Uh, this is, Suzelman Cowan Center always wants to prove its cultural sensitivity chops. So I should say, particularly to our visiting American and to some extent Canadian, uh, that was October 1st, it was October. wasn't it? Uh, guess, uh, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, there's much to be uh, thankful for, especially if you're not in the US, I think. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we will have some fixins later, as I say, to help celebrate uh, that occasion. If you're going to tweet about this, and please feel free to, uh, and then you can guilt-free play with your telephones, uh, it's at uh, Cowan Center. And if you are going to um, do something that involves a hashtag, including Slido, it's hashtag ODR Melbourne. So please um, get busy. You're also welcome to explore the ODR playground as part, of an, as part of the elective speed dating session, or you can visit providers during your breaks. The playground will feature an interactive exhibition where delegates can experience a live demonstration of ODR <clears throat> platforms in operation. I'd like to, they were thanked yesterday, but I'd like to thank again the sponsors uh, that make an event like this possible. The Department of Justice and Regulation, Victoria, <coughs> the Fair Work Commission, the Ian Potter Foundation, the Transport Accident Commission, uh, the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal, which is invariably known as VCAT, uh, the Victorian Legal Services Commission and Board, and the Water and Energy Ombudsman. Kind of revealing who sponsors this, and those are all fertile areas of growth for ODR and other kinds of dispute resolution. So the objectives of today's symposium are to provide an extensive and experiential learning opportunity for strategic decision makers in Australia interested in ODR as a mechanism for improving efficiency and access to justice through technology. And I think those two must always be wed. So uh, we're interested in using the technology to make this system more efficient and appealing, uh, but we also should never lose sight of the fact that it is all in aid of en enhancing access to justice. We're going to showcase and critically review the variety of ODR approaches and technologies. We're going to create, we hope to create, a network of practitioners and policymakers with a specialist interest in developing ODR in Australia. Now, on your seats, you are either sitting on or have picked up a lingo bingo <laughs> card. Um, and that's got, uh, it's uh, designed by Code for Australia. And every time you hear one of those terms used, it's better as a drinking game, but we're do doing it in <laughs> lingo bingo at the moment. Um, every time you hear one of those terms, cross them off. And at the end of the day, the person who's crossed off the most terms uh, gets a prize. I'm not sure what it is, I've been told. But it was a very attractive prize. So you will want to uh, take that seriously. Okay, so... 
let's get going. Um, I was supposed to talk about a definition of ODR. Do we need to do that? Oh, I <laughs> Anybody want a discussion of what is ODR? It's going to change anyway by the time the answer is over. Not take an hour and nobody and it won't matter anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I once chaired a session of the Australian Law Reform Commission, a, a community consultation, which was in the Byron Bay area, which was, you know, chosen for our convenience. And the, um, uh, the first question I got was from somebody who said, what is justice anyway? And I thought, yeah, we, we passed over that rather quickly and got back on to the genetic privacy, which was the subject of the day. Anyway, um, we're here with an extraordinarily distinguished uh, group of um, experts who are, um, I'm going to ask them, starting with Shannon, to introduce themselves briefly. And our topic is Around the World in 80 Minutes, Expert <coughs> Panel from Five Continents but we have a late scratching from Africa. Sorry, so it's really four continents. <laughs> I'm just back from Botswana, though, so I can, we can bump it up to five again, if you like. <laughs> Shannon? Thank you, David. Uh, so my name is Shannon Salter. I'm the chair of the Civil Resolution Tribunal, and uh, the tribunal is the first online tribunal in Canada. It was one of the first examples in the world of publicly integrated ODR, and we have jurisdiction over strata property disputes, small claims, and soon motor vehicle personal injury disputes. I'm a lawyer and uh, an adjunct prof and a tribunal uh, decision maker by training. Uh, I teach law at uh, Nanchang University, uh, China. Also, I'm me mediator for um, International Commercial Mediation Center for Belt and the Road Initiative. And yeah. Thank you. I'm Mike here, and I'm a practicing uh, QC in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, I do online uh, dispute resolution, uh, is uh, mainly in the area of international sport. Uh, including cricket, and you may remember your Mr. Smith and a South African bowler, uh, Mr. Rabada. Yeah. Uh, and uh, anyhow, uh, but I'm uh, the founder of a New Zealand a private online dispute resolution company called CODA, which is a made up name, stands for Complete Online Dispute Resolution. I wanted to call it Yoda, but my kids wouldn't let me. <laughs> uh, that's me. Hi, my name is Colin Rule. I'm Vice President of Online Dispute Resolution at a company called Tyler Technologies. Um, I was the Director of Online Dispute Resolution at eBay and PayPal for eight years and then spun a company out called Modria uh, that we ran for five or six years and then we got acquired by Tyler. So Tyler is the largest provider of court case management software, e-filing software in the United States. So they're now building the Modria platform into their suite of services. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Paolo Cortez. I'm a professor at the University of Leicester in England. As you can tell from my accent, I'm from Spain originally. <laughs> um, I have worked for the European Commission for a few months um, as a consultant where they were drafting the legislation. Um, and I am also working as a part-time adjudicator uh, for CEDAR, which is an ADR provider. Uh, dealing with aviation disputes, delays, and cancellations mostly, uh, which is using the Modria platform. Um, that's me. Okay, I'm Katarina Palmgren. I work here in Victoria, the Magistrates Court, as a legal advisor to the uh, Magistracy, to the Chief Magistrate. My involvement in ODR really started in 2015 when consultants came into the court to look at how we can um, modernize the court system. And one of the recommendations were for all matters to be instituted online, small civil claims to be funneled into an online court. So I started looking into that. And this year, I completed a Churchill Fellowship on ODR, how we can use ODR to solve small civil claims and how we can best integrate an online court into our public justice system here in Victoria. Okay. Um, we're not getting any questions yet through the, um, I think. Oh, 
So there's an opportunity for you um, to, through the Slido app, to ask questions as, as per last night. Um, in the meantime, until they start to roll in. Uh, hmm? Oh, there we go. They're rolling already. Okay, well, I'm not. Let me start with one I was going to ask, which then feeds neatly into there. What's the best thing happening in ODR in your <laughs> jurisdiction? Whoever wants. Uh, well, I'll start in New Zealand. I'd like to say CODA. Uh, <laughs> it'll be a little bit obvious, but uh, in fact, I think collaboration, uh, CODA and Fairway and Tyler uh, uh, doing some thinking around automating um, a uh, case management system and exploration system for um, family disputes. And in particular, CODA is dealing with relationship property and Fairway deals with uh, family and relationship property, so we're looking at collaboration to build something in that area. That's probably, for me, most exciting. Yeah, don't be shy. I'll weigh in uh, from the U.S. Mm -hmm. context. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read the book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you correct. know, and he talks about how getting from zero to one percent is incredibly hard, mm -hmm. and then from one to two, it's a little bit easier than two to four. And what he says is you got to get up to 12 percent and then you cross the tipping point, and the last 88 happens very quickly. And I think what we're seeing in the US, particularly in courts, is that we are about to hit the tipping point. I think we're seeing a massive explosion of interest in online dispute resolution in the courts. The US traditionally has been behind in terms of court ODR. The innovations that have happened in Canada and in Europe have outpaced what's been happening. But now we see chief justices. We see the National Center for State Courts. We see foundations. They are talking about ODR. They are pushing ODR. RFPs and RFIs are coming out. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, I, as somebody who's been talking about ODR for a lot of years, I kind of feel a little bit like the dog that caught the car. <laughs> you know? It's like now people call me up and say, all right, you've been talking about this. Now let's do it. It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> Here we go, because there's a lot of organizational change we have to go through. But it's a very exciting time. And there, the challenges that we're dealing with are not awareness challenges. Now the challenges are execution challenges. So. Yeah, that's great. So, um, okay. Well, in the, in the UK, the most exciting thing is the is the so-called online court. The government has committed a huge investment of uh, one billion uh, pounds to digitalize the the whole court structure. Uh, as part of it, they are also creating a particular um, a process, the so-called online court, to deal with. Um, uh, low value claims, well, not so low value, up to 25,000 pounds. And it is really modeled in the Civil Resolution Tribunal in British Columbia. Uh, there is a lot of interest now on, on that currently in the UK. More broadly, in the European Union, uh, we have now a European platform, which is basically a website that allows consumers to submit complaints against European traders and merchants for uh, uh, services and, and uh, purchase of goods. And, and they can also identify and select a nationally certified ADR provider that has to process the complaints online. That's it. Oh, this is going to seem very self-serving, but <laughs> <laughs> the best and only ODR example in Canada mm. is us. Uh, but that said, we are seeing uh, a lot more interest in Canada uh, to develop other projects, and that has been a bit strange for us because we've always had way more interest in jurisdictions like Australia and England and the US than even within Canada, but that's starting to change. And in BC, about three or four other tribunals are adopting, actively implementing the CRT technology. So I think there's gonna be a lot more examples uh, one or two years from now <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm invited back to report on, on that. Oh, China, right? So um, two days ago, I went trip to sanctuary. Uh, it's a, it's a witness told me, uh, Lisa, he's a mediator. So now China's taking over the world. I said, why? <laughs> the government, uh, if the government uh, tells people what you are supposed to do, the people just do what they are told. And uh, uh, the annual conference, I asked a question to uh, Salon Shelter. I said, what difference between uh, Chinese Internet Court and uh, your CRT? He said, wow, 
China can build an internet code in two days. I heard that expression. <laughs> two months. I think. Uh, two months or two days. Uh, Roma is not built in three days. Um, yeah, and so that's very far. Uh, for example, like uh, the Hangzhou Internet Court is, uh, was built in 2017, August 18. Do you know what's the uh, good number, luck number for Chinese? And another number is nine. So this year, September, you look at me because he visited the Hangzhou Internet Court, uh, celebrated the one month old of Hangzhou Internet Court. And uh, you, you, I, I cannot sh show you the picture. His jaw, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and Hangzhou, uh, Beijing Internet Court is September 9th. Nine means forever. And uh, uh, Guangzhou Internet Court uh, established this year, September 28th. Two, that's eighty-two. So, 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 just one year. So, so many cases settled. And uh, one more thing. So, uh, very fast. For example, when we have the UK, uh, like twenty-seven, I it's uh, June. I ask uh, the uh, Chinese Internet Court. That time only Hangzhou Internet Court. I said, do you have the blockchain right now? We are talk about blockchain and ODR. <laughs> The, the, chair, the chief justice of uh, Internet Court said, uh, didn't answer it. The high court uh, didn't answer it. And second, they gave me the news. We have the blockchain. <laughs> I, I said, uh, oh, it's, it maybe it's a fake news. But I still didn't talk about the blockchain. <laughs> and end up with the Supreme Court. And uh, the same day, and they, they, they got the case. Just what you said. And uh, they used blockchain as evidence, ac a a admissible. Then the Supreme Court and they recognized it. Then every con at the uh, Hangzhou Internet Court and the Beijing Internet Court, uh, Guangzhou Internet Court, just follow it. That's the most amazing thing in our jurisdiction. And even, for example, when we talk about a service, so we use the cell phone, there's a pop-up and scream. You send them, for example, and I send this uh, like a uh, Korean rule, Korean law cannot use a cell phone. Lock it. So if you, you didn't say, I read, I read your, your service, then even you have the antivirus software, so it's still popular, you lock it, so it means you, you are served online. Uh, and so my phone is uh, mobile, so there's a three mobile telecommunication service company. Uh, so you all have this kind of service for you for China, so that means they all do, do together, just what the Lisa said. If you come, the let you do, what do the and, and the evidence, for example, blockchain, and the enforcement, you can do, like, and uh, bankruptcy, use online. Even you use online, like a, a, a blockchain platform. And uh, for example, my, I can use, use this kind of ID. Why? Enforcement issue. I cannot take a speed train, or the speed train. I cannot take an airplane if, because the whole nation, the enforcement, right? So that's what you, uh, Lisa told us, that if the government let you do, suppose to do something, the, the people is, yeah, do what they are told, the whole nation, just focus. But there's a difference, that's what you said. We are, you are common law, we are civil law. So it's very efficient. <laughs> so now I, I, I give this comment to the, where's the government here? Government. Go, government here, so you, so you have to, yeah, government. So very important, yeah. If I could piggyback on, on what Michael said, because uh, <laughs> he is not exaggerating when, I, when he says my jaw <laughs> dropped when I went into the Hangzhou Internet Court. I, we, did, we did blur over kind of what is ODR, and I think that's actually, uh, that wasn't a very interesting question a few years ago, but it's becoming a more interesting question because the definitions are broadening. I think there's a distinction between e-courts and ODR. Mm -hmm. And I think some people find the two confusing. I think China is by far the most innovative country when it comes to e-courts. And when you walk into these gorgeous new glass buildings, all of the walls are video screens. There's facial recognition when you walk in. So they pick out your case when you walk in the door. You walk up to a console, 
Now, again, a lot of us in the West, we get a little nervous when we hear about some of these things. But you walk up to a console and you speak to the console and you can see it write your legal filing in front of you on the console as you speak to it and describe your problem. It, it's gorgeous. It looks like the fanciest bank in the world. They have all these tellers with touch screens and you go sit down and you can file your case. They have a dis an ODR center right there. They even had virtual reality goggles that you could put on to be in the courtroom. And you see what it's like to stand in front of the judge and they, they simulate it so you're not surprised when it happens. And they have judges that 24 seven that are on video cameras doing hearings and you can dial in and participate remotely. So again, China, the, the beauty of the Chinese system is when the higher ups say we're gonna do this, they do it. And they have the resources and the technology. <coughs> and I think a lot of us, I think in the West, we have to persuade people that we need to move this way. We have to all get together and have meetings and say, well, maybe we should try and do this over video. Oh, no, no. But you know, in China, they go, boom, we're gonna do this, and they do it. And I have to say, these systems are overwhelming in terms of the innovation that they represent. We have a long way to go before we catch up. But I think in terms of ODR, the way that China thinks about ODR is quite a bit different than we think about it. They're, the facilitative side of these processes is not as well developed as I think what we're doing in the West. But the e-court side is is very advanced. So I want to uh, prove what you said because uh, he will have uh, Chinese uh, grandchildren. That's why he boasts the Chinese. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what is talk about, you saw the Robert right in front of you, right? When you uh, uh, meet the Hangzhou West Lake, yeah, the right. Robert, like now, right now the Robert is a, is a guide all over the country. And the, you, when you talk about VR, they use VR witness. Because when you talk about uh, like many, many words to try to describe it, you use virtual re reality. You use VR, you say, uh, you, you, can, you can imagine the witness is easy to is describe. And uh, actually, the Beijing, Beijing's the first uh, in, intermediate uh, court used the v virtual reality for the witness. I have the picture I showed uh, in Auckland, but I cannot show here. You, you can ask me, I, I will give you the, my, my email address, yeah. I think, it, I think uh, Colin makes a really interesting point too about, I, I really resist these fairly theoretical discussions about what is ODR or not and whether it includes telephone. I don't think any of that really matters. But I do think it does matter where we get to the discussion Colin's talking about where you have um, e-courts or e-filing masquerading as ODR and I think we, there is an important distinction, as Colin said, to be drawn there because one is basically sticking a technology process on an existing structure that is already disenfranchising a lot of people. ODR requires us to get down to the foundations and do the really difficult business process uh, development work to rethink every single thing that we do. And with respect, I think e-courts are a lot easier. It's way easier just to start accepting evidence and discovery electronically, but it doesn't, in my view, do almost anything to increase access to justice. It makes things a bit easier for lawyers and court clerks and judges, but that's about it. I think that's a very important point because when I did my Churchill Fellowship and I traveled around the world, and quite a few places saying they do ODR, but when you arrive, it's no more than e-filing and maybe a few online hearings. So I think that's very important. And on this point, what's the most exciting thing in your jurisdiction? You're all from here, so you know what's going on here. It's not that much yet, but the discussion has started, and I think that's people have an interest, and that's obviously great. And of course, the fact that um, VCAT got the funding to do the ODR pilot it's starting, and me coming from a core perspective, I hope VCAT will be the catalyst for change in the magistrate's court. And I think it's very important that we look to Canada in doing that, so we don't just do mm -hmm. e-filing and a few online hearings. So looking to VK, uh, sorry, to um, uh, the CRT in Canada, what they are doing, and also the blueprint that's been set out in the, in the UK for the online court. So we should do it right, and we should look <laughs> to the international experience. And just from the, our experience, likewise, the exploration part, uh, the phone calls, the discussion, the helping people, that's just such a massive part that we didn't bargain on at all. And we focused on the, oh, well, you know, the technology to do the hearings or mediations, arbitrations, et cetera. But in fact, the real, I think, is Katerina's paper so uh, eloquently describes the, the key is that 
early kind of triage and exploration process, I think. Okay, I might take um, the first one from the, through the technology. I think this is not an opportunity question, but a cautionary question. So not who can be left behind when jurisdictions adopt ODR, but who might be, is in danger of being left behind. And how are different jurisdictions uh, making efforts to maximize accessibility? So there's obviously a digital divide first issue at first. Well, I, I can weigh in on that. Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, having, we've been talking about ODR now for 20 years. And when we first started out with ODR, I would do presentations in fora like this and people would say, uh, well look, if you're using technology to, to expand access to justice, only rich people have technology. So you're essentially building a justice system for rich people. Because those are, the, those are the only people that have fast internet connections. Those are the only people that have laptops. And if, if you have to have those things to access it, so we would talk about you know, putting kiosks in libraries and things like that, or, or internet, you know, internet access clubs or things like that. It, it really didn't work. But you know, what happened? We got these. You know, I, the, I, at that time, we were all talking about trying to build one laptop per child. We were trying to get a $160 laptop that we could put into the developing world. Well, now in India, um, when you go to school, they give you a laptop, and it's five dollars. No, it's not a laptop; it's a tablet, and all your assignments and everything are available, you know, on the device. And we're talking about these tablets going back to villages where they don't even have electric lights. Mm -hmm. So the conversation around digital divide has changed quite a bit as technology has changed the access question. I think when we talk about access, we can't just think about who can actually access the service through a device. We have to think about other types of access too. And that may mean differently abled people. That mean, may mean cultural barriers. There's a lot of other kinds of obstacles we need to think about. It's not just rich poor anymore. There are other types of imbalances that we need to address. So I'm not saying that we've solved the problem. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to happen. But in the United States, at least, I think we're at a point where 98% of people in the US access the internet on a fairly daily basis. And that's almost the same percentage at which we decided that telephone access was important. And we started to provide services to people over telephones. And then the government actually invested in providing telephone access to rural areas. Well, that we may be in that circumstance soon with this technology too. When you check into a homeless shelter in Silicon Valley, they give you a phone. And it's a throwaway phone. But that's how they get in touch with you if they need you to communicate. We do a lot of work in India, and there are people who sleep on cardboard boxes on the street at night with their Nokia phones right next to their head because that's the lifeline to finding work and finding jobs and staying in touch. Uh, we've done projects in Africa and Central Asia where we're using phones to you know, communicate with populations that are not even literate. So it's all voice-based over the phone. So we need to think about this. We have to constantly push on access. But the questions have, have changed a lot. And it's not, even a, it's not even where technology is today, it's where it's going to go. And I think that continu continued expansion of access to technology, it's not going to be driven by ODR. It's going to be, be driven by other types of technological innovation. One last comment I'll make, and then I'll hand it back, because um, I'm wary about going on too long. Um, you know, when I went to China and I saw these gorgeous, gleaming glass buildings with all this technology in it, I thought, it's still kind of retro. Because the thought is there's still a place called a courthouse, and that is where justice happens in this building. You have to come to this building. I think the, f the courthouse of the future is this. This is the point of access to justice. And it's going to work kind of like e-commerce has transformed retail. You don't have stores. It's sort of out there in the cloud. It's a service available all the time. This is the way that people are going to get access to justice in the future. And if we just pave the cow paths of the existing process and we put more and more technology into the courts, we're not embracing the future that is really revolutionary, which is where everybody can open up their phone and click a couple buttons, and they can get a fast and fair resolution process that solves their problem. That's the more exciting North Star that we need to point to. And all the investments that are happening in China, I think, are a little retro compared to that, that North Star that we're heading towards. So. I'll just jump in. I, I agree with everything Colin said, and I think our experience is that the digital divide is is very much closed. I mentioned last night that out of 8,500 disputes that we've received, only about 10 people have asked not to use email. But I think the other hidden part of this is that anything you create can disenfranchise people or marginalize people. And that's a design issue. And you have to have a really clear-eyed focus on 
human-centered design, putting yourselves in the shoes of people who would experience those barriers, really understanding their needs, and then designing around it, either through multi-channel, um, by making sure staff are appropriately trained. And I ranted about this last night too, but a lot of those things are not technology issues. Again, they're design issues, they're culture issues. What are the core values of your organization? And in a public justice context, my job is to make sure nobody is left behind, nobody falls through the crack, to lift everybody up. So again, um, human-centered design, I think, is the path to address a lot of those marginalization questions. So um, China, uh, the ODR have the good uh, infrastructure. For, for example, China is promote uh, e-commerce. The e-commerce, you have to send the, the internet to the countryside. Now, how popular the Chinese use the cell phone? So if you go to the, uh, have, a, have your hair cut, they have a rope, a gun for you, and the gun, there's a transparent here. You can have a ha hair cut. Do you know? There's a hole, it's a transparent. You can uh, read your, yeah, your phone here. People use cell phone very much. So it's, it's very popular in China, so. Even you, when you have a haircut, you ha have your haircut, you still can use your cell phone. Oh. Yeah, yeah there's the rope and the gun, then they're transparent, just like this. I can see you. <laughs> Add here. that to the list of Chinese. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Being able to read it's my popular. phone while my hair gets cut, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Vivian. <clears throat> I think I'm coming from the court perspective when you're talking about an online court. In my report, I suggest that the online court should be mandatory. Um, I have the stats in front of me, and 88% of all Australians uh, are using internet. So th there's always going to be a group that don't, but even amongst the people using it, we have to remember that even if I'm fluent in the use of Google or a social media app, doesn't mean that I'm confident conducting proceedings online, and that's what's important, what Shannon is saying, it has to be a very, the design of the platform has to make it easy for people to use it. But even if it is, there's still, from a core perspective, there's still going to be people that need assistance, so I argue that in, in my report that we need to have self-help centers in the courts that assist these people that cannot do it themselves online because there's always going to be those people that they come into the court and they get help by court staff to get through this uh, process. So I think it's very important to have that. Pablo, did you want to add anything on that? Uh, no. <laughs> well, I, yeah, no, I, I agree with everything that, that has been said already. Um, I think that people with, you know, uh, low literacy levels, other people will need definitely assistance. I don't believe that DIY assistance uh, driven by technology is sufficient for those people. I think there are always people that need humans to help them. But humans can also help them to uh, access ODR. It doesn't have, as, as you just explained, you know, it can be in the courthouse or can be elsewhere. It can be in a law clinic, it can be in a university, it can be elsewhere, consumer associations and so on. So definitely there is a need to, to provide support for those who cannot easily access um, ODR. <coughs> Okay, next question, are you seeing an increased use of behavioral insight interventions, e.g. nudging, or nudging if you're Jewish, and big data in ODR platforms? I can pipe in here. We, just because we did recently just finish a, a pilot where we took the negotiation phase of our ODR system and uh, hired a contractor to do behavioral insights. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, it's something that pri the private sector does a lot. Um, insurance companies, banking sector, every time they're trying to nudge their customers to use an online platform or to renew their insurance early. So they create incentives through um, nudging and, and, and appealing to people's uh, psychological, I guess, um, inclinations. Anyway, so we were taking that, uh, that learning and all of those case studies and figuring out how to apply it to the public sector. Now we're obviously not a for-profit entity, but we think that it's better for people if they can resolve their disputes earlier. Um, so within a pretty strict ethical framework that's obviously different in a pu public sector context, we're looking at how we can frame our communications, our emails, even the platform and the language to nudge people towards talking, uh, towards uh, being respectful with each other all with the goal of helping them to resolve their dispute early. And I actually think that this um, is kind of, uh, is flying a bit under the radar, but it has at least as much potential, if not more potential, than artificial intelligence, I think, and, and uh, predictive analytics in the justice context, because the justice system 
already has a set of incentives and disincentives. They just tend to be ones that work for justice actors and not so much for the public. But if we can consciously reframe that and create incentives and disincentives that are better for people, I think that's worth exploring. Yeah, I, I'll weigh in on this too. Um, uh, we have a concept in online dispute resolution called the fourth party. And the fourth party, obviously party one and party two are the disputants. Party three is the human third party, the neutral. And technology is the fourth party. And the thing about the fourth party is it's getting smarter all the time. Um, now, a very experienced mediator that I worked with uh, told me once, you know, Colin, mediation is benevolent manipulation. <laughs> and I agree with that. I think really what mediation is is assisted negotiation. And what we found is the fourth party can be really good at assisting a negotiation. You know, a lot of what Silicon Valley does is nudging, right? That if you think about gamification, yeah. if you think about, you know, they want to make their services sticky and intuitive, and there's a lot of research into how to do that. Uh, one of the things we found at eBay was, for instance, um, if you give the complainant the first open text box in a dispute, and in most cases at eBay, that's the buyer. They're the aggrieved party, and they're upset. If you give them an open text box, they're going to be upset. <laughs> they're going to maybe make threats, maybe make insults. You know, They're going to try and maximize their leverage against who they perceive as the more powerful counterparty, which is the seller. But what we found is the tone of that first message was highly correlated, because we looked at hundreds of millions of these disputes, it was highly correlated with whether or not the parties were going to be able to achieve an outcome by mutual agreement. So what we did was a little tricky. We actually gathered all the information from the complainant in structured forms. And they're very detailed forms. But what kind of problem do you have? We get all the detail. What kind of resolution are you looking for? So then we actually would write that first message for them with our language, which avoided the threats and insults. And we would say to them, is this accurate? Is this what, yeah, and they would say, yeah, that's right. So then the counterparty, who's the seller, they already have the money. They, they care about their reputation. Like they want the buyer to be happy, but if you give them an open text box, they post, and we also coach them. We give them the language and say, here's an example. Or, you know, you can write your own first message and we'll put it in there for you. But it says things like, I'm so sorry you had this experience. I take care of my buyers. I'm committed to your satisfaction. Let's, let's find a way to solve this problem. I want to reserve, I want to do this. So then the first open message came from the respondent, which avoided that very aggressive first message, and we saw resolutions by mutual agreement go up 30%, okay? Now, is that manipulation? Yeah, it is. <laughs> but you know what? We don't have an outcome. We don't have a dog in the fight. It's not, we're not trying to bias the process in favor of one or the other. All we know is we have all, and this is, gets to the second part of the question, which is about big data. You know. I have disputes sometimes, and I work face to face in the courts, where the parties come in and their expectations are wildly out of whack. You know, the merchant is like, I'm sorry they had this experience, I'll give them 100 bucks. And the, the consumer comes in and says, time off work, emotional damages, you know, I want $10,000. And you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get these parties into, this, into a ZOPA, a zone of potential agreement? Well, maybe one thing you can do in the process is when the complainant is coming in and they say, look, this is a landlord-tenant dispute, they won't give me back my security deposit, you can say, well, here's a readout of the last three years. These are all of the disputes that the court has processed that fits your, your criteria. This is a distribution graph of the outcomes that were achieved in those disputes. Now, we're not saying that the distribution graph is going to dictate your outcome. You may think, no, I really do deserve $10,000 in this case. But when you see that 99% of these cases were settled for less than $1,500, you may say to yourself, again, this is before you've even negotiated with the counterparty, you may say, oh, well, maybe $10,000 isn't a reasonable expectation. And maybe that increases the likelihood that the parties are going to be able to find a resolution within the ZOPA. Is that manipulation? Yeah, it's manipulation. But do we think that that's okay? Is that, if we're designing a process, we're dispute systems designers, we're trying to build a level playing field with transparency, is it fine to use data in that way? And again, it's not a mediator that's suggesting that outcome. This is the fourth party coming in and saying, look, this is data pulled out of the public record and presented to you in easily intelligible format so you can make sense of it, so that you can factor it into your own expectations. So these are examples of how technology can engage in this nudging behavior. Now we don't wanna cross the line, Right? We don't want to say to the consumer, oh, your expectations are too high. And we don't want to say to the, the merchant, oh, your expectations are too low. Because then we are really being overly manipulative. We have to work together to figure out what thresholds we're comfortable with. But I think that's fine. 
And I think that that kind of, that kind of innovation is what we should be doing in designing these systems and evaluating them over time so they're learning systems so they get better and better. So mm -hmm. hopefully that's relevant. So when you talk about fourth party, so first definition of ODI is a fourth party. So right now the AI is, a, is a, we won't take over the third party, but it will be maybe fourth party in China. So when you talk about AI, you have talk about the big data. So you will see, check the peop, uh, uh, Supreme People's Court website. You will see an a, a, a article about its uh, uh, top court reviews the seven years each in marriage is true. You have you watched the seven years uh, each? Maybe that's an American movie. <laughs> so, so in China, it's like a diversified uh, dispute resolution. Means not just uh, solve the le legal problem, also prevent. So you have this kind of data, then you can prevent. And uh, also we have like, uh, we, uh, we use the word like uh, uh, similar case, uh, uh, similar outcome. So if uh, maybe you think uh, I, I bought it, I boast uh, of, of myself. If you have a pen, you can write it down. G-R-I-D-S-U-M dot com. Let's talk about the intelligent uh, uh, court. And uh, yeah, it's uh, like, uh, that kind of uh, platform, it, yeah, algorithm or big data, AI, or insight. That's my evidence. I just <coughs> add one thing to that. I, I think, I mean, that's, that's pretty extraordinary. That's something that we're looking at too, is how do you use AI in a way that's ethical? And I think it's way less problematic to do that at the providing legal information stage, the front end stage, if you're transparent about the algorithm, where it comes from, what you do with it, you make it publicly available. That's a great tool because people don't know how to value their legal problems. They don't know what it's worth. It helps them manage their expectations. The more along the spectrum you move towards the adjudicative phase where it's assisting the judge in decision making, that's where it gets more eth ethically complicated. And I think like anything else, a good place to start and figure out what the risks and opportunities are is in that low stakes legal information uh, front end uh, uh, position. One other thing that was really startling for us is that we learned that people really trust the legal information we provide through the question and answer portal we have, which is a basic form of AI, way more than even their lawyer or a staff member telling them the exact same information, even though, of course, the content came from lawyers. And so we realize that that's quite a responsibility. People tend to really put a lot of trust in things they read online, which we know from the fake news epidemic. But it, it, it just is uh, a, something that kind of surprised us and that uh, has caused us to take this responsibility even more seriously. Anybody else on that? Okay. I'll take the next question, a very general one. How far away are we in Australia from implementing ODR, I guess more fully, uh, in our courts? It's a good one for Katarina. Um, I mean, that depends completely on the government, doesn't it? Funding. Uh, I think. I think it's going to happen, this is a question. I said this yesterday at the launch of the report for those that were there. It's going to happen, it's just a question of when it will happen. And you need a commitment, both the political, financial and philosophical commitment to having an online court and moving forward. I can't say, predict when it will happen, but I hope soon. I hope government read my report and yeah, start the process. I mean, VCAT has started, so I hope that um, the courts will start, but I cannot say when it will happen. Um, I'm very positive uh, for Australia. Uh, ODR in Australia is uh, G O R. What's G? Great. O is not online, it's ocean. Uh, R is road. Um, when I travel the road, I saw the, uh, the kangaroo. Kangaroo forward is not backward. Oh, Australia is forward. <laughs> and uh, I saw a uh, uh, koala. <laughs> it's sort of like a meditation. Why do you call Why do you need ODR? Because everyone wants to see the on the tree house, like a self the legal program, right? So you have two, two animals. That's the future of uh, Australia. <laughs> and uh, so I want to show you more. So when I come to Australia, I applied online. But actually, I don't need the five pages like this. 
<laughs> because everything just electronic, just uh, and uh, when I was in can uh, in here, I said, yeah, you ask me show you my passport? Do you know Chinese? <laughs> then I put my slide, my passport over there. Oh, Chinese! <laughs> then just like come to you, uh, Canada, just like use this kind of uh, like go to the like uh, opera. <laughs> that can take it. That's a potential. You have infrastructure for ODR, <laughs> right? But anyway. Uh, I throw that away, it's, it's uh, not, an, I have to uh, collect my, that five page bit to have my uh, personal information over there. <laughs> right now, you are say, you know the Ancestral Working Group for Electronic Commerce. Right now, it have the conference about identity management. If we all use the, like, uh, like uh, electronic, I, I can manage my personal information very well. No, I, no, I don't have to collect my five pages. So right now, yeah, it's uh, so very important. So I, I, I positive for Australia. Remember, you are kangaroo, <laughs> forward. <laughs> you are called <laughs> You need the family tree house, right? You want to yeah, enjoy your life for ODR. That's, koala is demanding. That's the, it's, it's a market for ODR. So right now the problem is your, your garment. <laughs> I will give suggestion your garment later on. Yeah. I think I'm gonna yeah. add something here. More, and <laughs> I, I'm gonna be a bit boring compared to you and a bit more negative because I think this is something worth raising and that I asked every jurisdiction I went to, it was how's your IT infrastructure? How's your internet speed? And everyone just looked at me and go, good. Because I think Australia, we have to really consider the reliability and speed of our internet before we create an online court and make that mandatory. And what was emphasized to me in jurisdictions was there is not going to be nothing worse. People are not going to use the system if they're sitting there and, and the pages are not loading. So a slow system is unacceptable for a mandatory online court. So I'm a bit more negative on that point, but I think it's a, a really important consideration in <coughs> Australia if we create an online court, is our IT infrastructure. But in fairness, our government's working on a coal-fired uh, broadband. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we'll, we'll make everything work much better. If I could just say, too, I, I think there are three things that give me a lot of optimism for ODR in, uh, in uh, Australia. One is this conference. I mean, it's amazing to see who showed up. Like, this is, a, this is an incredible audience of decision makers. I mean, Kathy has done an excellent job bringing people together. So that interest I find gratifying and I find it's growing year by year. The second is um, the VCAT project. I mean, that's an amazing project. And again, the obstacles are not technological, they're human and organizational. So to have those conversations and get that kind of buy-in is crucial. And the third is Katerina's report. I think that's a, everyone in this room should read that document. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd actually like for you to summarize your recommendations. That was one of the questions people asked. But I really feel like that report is going to be a watershed event. And I would like to see people mobilize around it because she did such a great job talking to all the stakeholders around the world. But that document could be the the theses that you nail to the door of the <laughs> cathedral like Luther, you know, like this. I, I, so there are many, many good reasons for optimism. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, oh. I, I just joined in Colin having read it in the middle of the night, not being able to sleep. And, uh, to continue the metaphor that, you know, Kiwis, there aren't many of them, they only come out at night. So I don't know what that means for online <laughs> <laughs> ODR, yeah. but um, yeah, Katerina's report just distills down the years that people have been working on this, and you can read it, and I've only been doing it for two years, and I went, oh, bugger, you know, <laughs> if only I'd had that at the start, it's just fantastic. Mm -hmm. One thing is you, as Aussies, are miles ahead of us, so we'll be watching with real interest, I think. So maybe I miss one thing, because it's not the two animals. Third animal is the cat. <laughs> Victoria cat! <laughs> More than that, I saw the online divorce APP, Australia. Then I asked uh, Ian, I said, do you have a New Zealand that have this? Ian said, we don't have. So you, you have potential. Thank you, uh, uh, Kathy, you bring so many the decision makers here. Yeah, government too, yeah.
So the future here. And uh, ODR, just like as uh, popular as uh, GOR, will be attraction. Mm. So why, why, why do you go to your, uh, uh, Australia? It's uh, ODR. And uh, because you can have the, oh, just like Canada, they have the ODR platform for consumer protection plus uh, GOR. <laughs> yeah, more traction. It's a business. You, it's making money. It's not invest money, okay? Got it, your government. <laughs> but, but back to Katerina's report. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it really is worth a read. It's really well written, very plain language. It's not a massive treaties. I think you've made it very accessible for everybody. And I, you, it might be worth just summarizing your key recommendation, right? I mean, you, you make some pretty pointed recommendations. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I was a bit nervous about sitting with the real experts, so thank you. It means a lot that you're saying that. Um, should I just summarize them now? Yeah, yeah. please. Okay, I, I'm just going to basically read them. So uh, the yeah. overarching recommendations that I'm making is nine of them, and uh, there's a lot more detail in the report, but these are the overarching recommendations, and that is that Firstly, we establish an online court um, in Victoria that focuses on early dispute resolution for a fully integrated end-to-end -end online system constituting four dis uh, distinct stages, like they do with the CRT, so the exploration stage, which I think is the most important and revolutionizing stage to give actually the court users the information that they need to proceed on in the process. So yeah, the exploration stage, negotiation stage, facilitation stage, and adjudication stage. I recommend that we um, establish the online court as a division of the Magistrates Court of Victoria with a jurisdiction to deal with low value civil claims up to $10,000 so the matters to go to arbitration. At the moment that can be expanded in the future. We can uh, increase the monetary value in the future but I suggest we start here. And uh, I say that we need to ensure long term bipartisan government support up front and funding and avoid um, pilot projects. Um, Establish an interdisciplinary development implementation team comprising of legal experts, of course, um, judiciary, technical writers, solution architects, and user experience designers. The team should, if possible, be led um, by a member of the judiciary. So it was emphasized on my trip that the change really has to come and be led from within the courts with mm -hmm. full support, obviously, from the government. Um, Purchase or license an interoperable off-the-shelf system from a third-party developer, an expert in the area. Uh, customize to suit the needs and requirements of the magistrate's court. And six, uh, make the jurisdiction of the online court mandatory, avo avoiding all, um, sorry, avoiding a parallel paper-based path. And in making that recommendation, I am saying that we also need to establish self-help centers in the court buildings to assist those individuals that need to um, assistance accessing and or navigating the online court. Eight, uh, ensure appropriate security measures to protect the information communicated and stored on the online platform. And finally, it's really important that we ensure open justice solutions uh, to the new online court model. And I don't, yeah, that's something that needs to be looked into further. So that's the recommendations. Uh, that's pretty briefly. No, I, I very much agree with all the recommendations, although I, I would be more open to have to run pilot um, uh, cases. But uh, I, I think that there is also a need to, to reimagine justice. Um, I think that bringing the existing procedures online as they are, it will not do the trick. And, and um, I, a turning point in the UK was to convince the senior judiciary, and obviously it was later, it was a political decision to make the investment. Um, but uh, one of the success stories is with the um, divorce ap filing applications that there is a high number of uh, pro se litigants or litigants in person uh, and 40% of the applications were dismissed because of incomplete information <laughs> and now through the online process uh, now they, they drop out uh, this is 0.5 percent but I think it's also you know if we, if we so there is there is there is a need to, to building assistance for for, for the court users in this context, but also to think more widely. So if we are going to have an online court where judges will be dealing with cases remotely, it does not make sense to have generalist uh, judges. So when you have local judges, district judges, they need to be generalist uh, 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 judges. But 
if you have them all centralized or largely centralized, it makes more sense to have a specialist judges. So like, you know, like the way ombudsman schemes also increasingly operate. And, you know, increasing also they are, you know, building on the triage and, and promoting, um, you know, um, a consensual settlements when, when possible before reaching the final stage. I'll check the next question from the audience, which was, uh, is there a difference in the success rates of ODR when both parties are citizens, e.g. offense, offensing dispute between neighbors, compared to a dispute in which one party is a commercial entity? Yeah, um, it's, it's hard to make a definitive statement about that. Um, uh, obviously, a lot of the expertise that we have in terms of cross-border issues are e-commerce related. You know, neighbor, dis neighbor disputes are a little bit different than buyer-seller disputes. Um, you know, there's so many different kinds of disputes. I think it's a little bit tricky maybe for me to say something definitive about comparing these. I will say that some of the people, ODR really shines when you have a high volume of cases because that's where really you can replicate a lot of the steps in a process. If you only have a handful of cases and they're all very unique and they don't have anything to do with each other, it's hard to build technology that's effective in that context. So I thought it was interesting that DCAP made the decision to focus on um, businesses, business disputes, because those entities will have lots of cases and they're all quite similar. So that's an easy case to be made for the integration of ODR. It really, you know, if you're a, a business and you have lots of debt collection disputes, ODR shines because you can set, you can contact people and they can come into a structured process and, you know, they can work out payment plans. Some of the results we've seen for the court work we've done in the U.S. is we can cut times to resolution. I mean, we're, we're doing some court cases where the average time when it goes to a hearing to decision is like two or three months. The average time for face-to-face -face mediation is usually about a month. The average time for ODR is six days. And we, we have cases that get resolved in 24 hours, and it happens over a weekend. And the resolution is achieved at, at midnight on a Tuesday. You know, it's just the efficiency of these processes in cranking out decisions is incredible. So uh, I think when you talk about consumer merchant disputes, I think it's very easy to make the case for ODR. When you talk about things like workplace disputes or family disputes or neighbor disputes, it's a little bit more complicated. But we're, we're creating models that work effectively in those disputes, even as emotional and complex as they are, um, that are getting you know, really high success rates. We also have found that the ODR processes that we're deploying have resolution rates higher than the face-to-face -face dispute resolution processes. But I think that they're rough, roughly equivalent. I'm not sure if it's, they're, they're statistically significant. But we're resolving 74% of the cases by mutual agreement going through ODR, whereas face-to-face -face is resolving about 71% of cases. Mm -hmm. But for me, again, ODR is very focused on getting the parties to work together to come up with a resolution themselves. And then the evaluative process, the hearing or an arbitration or whatever, is only a safety net for the, the last 20% of cases. And our goal should be to minimize the amount of cases that are actually going to that evaluative stage. In the US, of civil court cases filed, 98% of them resolve before they get to a hearing. And if you think about the volume of cases that are actually going to the civil courts, that's a tiny percentage of the overall volume of disputes. So when the courts say to me, well, based on the cases that we see, you know, we think that this is what disputes look like in our jurisdiction, that's kind of like looking at the toenail of the elephant and trying to envision the whole elephant because you know, the estimates at, e at, at eBay, again, we were doing 60 million disputes a year. Our estimates are there's more than a billion cross-border e-commerce disputes every year. How many disputes are there in Australia every year? Hundreds and hundreds of millions of disputes. And the vast, vast majority of those never make it into the court. And the court traditionally has built obstacles to incentivize parties to not come to the court. So um, I'll, I'll tell one other anecdote and then I'll hand it over. Um, in Brazil, when you fly into the airport, they have a sign over the baggage claim that says, how was your flight? If you have a complaint, why not file a lawsuit? <laughs> <laughs> and they actually have a courtroom right next to the baggage claim. And you can walk over and for free, you can file your case, okay? Now everybody laughs when they hear that. But you know what? Brazil has it right. That's what we need to be doing. The courts need to be processing 100 times more cases than they're currently processing. 
because that's how many disputes there are here. And every single cell phone, every issue you have with an e-commerce purchase or your telecom bill or your water bill or your neighbor, you should be able to come in and fast and free file that case and get a fast path to resolution through your phone. That's the kind of revolutionary thinking we need to think about. And the courts right now, when you're dealing with 10,000, 20,000, barely holding on, you go, oh my gosh, how could I possibly handle 250,000 cases? But those are the cases that are out there and we're not addressing those people. If you want to expand access to justice, we need to think about this in a revolutionary way to change the way that we deliver our services. And algorithms can help us, but we can't send all those cases in front of judges. Yeah. So. Okay. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just again agree with Colin, which I seem to be doing a lot <laughs> these days. But I would just add to that, that I see one mistake, well, in my view it's a mistake, uh, that some jurisdictions are making when they talk about ODR is in kind of an attempt to appease the judiciary or to make them feel more comfortable with the change. They build models that are still very judge-centric or very tribunal member-centric. In order for ODR to work, we need to accept the idea that not all disputes need to be mediated or decided by judges. That judges in most jurisdictions are the most expensive, most specialized part of your process. And they are often, the they're a really good tool for a particular kind of problem, and I say this as a quasi-judge myself, um, but in order to make ODR work, we need to accept the idea that 98% of disputes or more can be resolved earlier by non-judges, even by non-legally trained people in a lot of cases. And until we accept that, until we um, can accept that as a profession, I think we're gonna have some real cultural uh, obstacles uh, that we need to overcome. So. Um, so you, if you check the uh, Ch Supreme People's Court of China, you will see the uh, online mediation platform. Online mediation, that's what you said. And so like even the uh, Chinese Internet Court, uh, many, many cases and uh, result before litiga litigation, just mediation, yeah. Uh, for example, right now, like in <coughs> Beijing, I got about uh, five, five, five thousand fifty cases, of, um, from September 9th to August thirty first, but um, two, about two thousand, almost two thousand, one thousand nine hundred over, settled by mediation. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, just a. <coughs> A further stat uh, from New Zealand, our general, our lowest court, the equivalent of the magistrate's court, it's called the district court, its jurisdiction runs from about 25000 up to, more recently, about $350,000, and it covers the entire country, there's more than 30 courts, so you were, and there's uh, 150 judges, so that general civil jurisdiction where you can sue people for more than 25, less than three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars in a country of nearly five million people they dispose of something like 700 cases over the last five years per annum now what does that tell you people just aren't going can't afford it going elsewhere going to tribunals not going just exactly as we're being told it's a you know it's a disgrace frankly uh, that's what this needs to fix. Just to add briefly, I think that um, going back to the question, I think the processes, they need to be designed according to to the type of disputes and the parties. So we will have imbalance of power between, you know, a um, consumer and a merchant. You know, you, you need to incorporate that into the process. And that, no, that that's something that ombudsman schemes know very well, naturally. And, you know, um, when um, a common, um, design in, in the UK is that the decisions are not binding for the consumer, but they are binding for the merchant when accepted by the consumer. Because obviously the, the, the merchants are repeat players. They, 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 they can also play the system. Mm -hmm. So you know, we need to, to take that into consideration when, when designing um, the processes. That's it. Anybody else? It's an interesting one. Um, if ODR isn't introduced or introduced more widely, are you concerned that you will need to educate an emerging generation of digital users how to interact with non-digital services? <laughs> we had, for the, those of you not from Australia, we recently had a non-binding 
but effective plebiscite on same-sex marriages in which you had to return a postal vote. So I had my kids, I had to have a, a um, tutorial on, this is an envelope, <laughs> <laughs> and this is a stamp, yeah. and I can tell you where to buy them. And then you have to put the completed thing in a post box. So <laughs> it took a few runs, but I think they, <laughs> they got the handle. So are we in danger of do it, replicating that bizarre effort in the dispute resolution area yeah. if we don't go fully ODR or more fully ODR? Yeah, I mean, uh, my law clerk, <clears throat> I had to explain about manual filing and what a, a check was because we still unless you've got a credit card, we still have to pay a filing fee by cheque. And so my law clerk, you know, she's uh, early 20s, she says, what? <laughs> <laughs> so what is a cheque, actually? <laughs> There's a real risk here that's, sorry, I'm jumping in. And would anybody else like to <laughs> have a lot of opinions? I can say something quickly. I think it goes to the question that's to trust the trust in the online court. Um, people are worried about people not trusting it being online, but I think that people might lose trust and confidence in the court if the court doesn't modernize. Yeah. That's my opinion on it. So yeah, it, it, that's, ex that's exactly my anxiety because in the same day I'll be at a conference where I'm speaking to a room full of judges and court administrators and the debate is, should we do this? Is it a good idea to use email at all? Well, I'm not sure. And it, it's kind of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic because later in the day, I'll be on a technology panel as the token public sector person with uh, entrepreneurs uh, like you, Michael. And, uh, and they are able to pick their market segment. You know, Michael can decide he's marketing his product to uh, people who are college educated, English speakers who have a particular kind of problem. And that's his right. I have to worry about everybody, making sure nobody falls through the cracks. So what I worry about is the alternativization of our public justice system. It's already happened, people are voting with their feet, but what is the end game there? Like, w are we not just hurtling towards obsolescence of the public system if we continue to refuse to modernize so that people either can't participate at all, or if they can afford to or fit into a market segment, they can pursue private ODR uh, alternatives. Is that really a, what we want our public institutions to look like? The reason I work in the public context is because I'm a huge believer in the public system. But I, I worry about this because I see that those things are not integrated and they're silos and uh, you know, it, it, it's, it is very worrying to me. Um, so um, I, I showed a slide in Auckland uh, that uh, China, like promote ODR, they have the orient orientation room in the online court. Even they put on the news and uh, the many, 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 many people visit uh, the internet court website. And uh, they only, they have, they have the, like uh, some people on, uh, online, just like, uh, you, you, you treat the ODR, just what you guys said. It's, it's you have to let the court approach the people, just like uh, you, like marketing your product. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now China is uh, sort of like that. Even you go to, uh, you, uh, go to the internet court, um, they have the public tool orientation. For foreigners, you have to let me know in advance, <laughs> at least maybe 10 days, because you need approval. Yeah. Approve. Yeah, approval. Just like uh, you did. Permission. You have so, so you you visit China. So second day, Michael, I want to visit the internet court. And um, so that's that's a process. But anyway, it's uh, we we idea is um, we have to use the court. It's not a traditional court. In China, you know, tradition the court is uh, intimidating. So right now, you just treat it as a market. What do you get? Just you did. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll weigh in on this too. In the U.S., uh, when I meet with judges, they're, they they talk increasingly about something they call the spiral of irrelevance, <laughs> and that's their fear that they're just not going to be used. And it, when you talk about, oh, can we educate you know millennials to <laughs> fill out checks and <laughs> fax in documents and send in postal? The, the re research shows they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. They're going to invent wholly new systems. Uh, you know, if you sit down with a twenty-year-old and you say, okay, well, you have to come into the court and stand in line on Wednesday between 
you know, forget it. Like it doesn't matter. They're just they're out. Like they'll che they'll they'll check out. The other thing is, you know, what we're talking about here is we're trying to reinvent the justice system to make it relevant, to make it to utilize these technologies. But I just want to put on the radar of people, there's much more disruptive revolutionary stuff on the horizon. Yeah. And you know, people talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence. We'll see. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to happen before we have digital judges deciding cases. But uh, smart contracts, I'm worried that what I say right now is going to, there's 10 people are going to call bingo because it's all the buzzwords. <laughs> but this whole notion of replacing paper contracts with what they call smart contracts, which are really little computer programs. And now you can go to Rocket Lawyer and LegalZoom and these websites in the US and you can build a smart contract and then both sides can <coughs> e-sign that smart contract. Amy's nodding because I know she's writing about this. And then that contract is self-enforcing. It, it is a program, a computer program, that lives in the cloud and monitors <laughs> certain uh, key performance indicators and then it will execute. It will move money from one place to another. It will change assets from one place to another. And then you put that smart contract in the blockchain which is a global, distributed, unalterable ledger. Now, again, these may sound like buzzwords and they're on the little cards there, <laughs> but the point about this system is that there are technologists and innovators who are building a whole new legal system that doesn't require lawyers, it doesn't require courts, it doesn't care where you are. Jurisdiction is irrelevant. You're writing computer programs that replace the need for the legacy judicial system. So when people say to me, uh, we don't like what you're doing, it's a little bit too aggressive in, in terms of, I'm like, just wait. <laughs> if, if you insist that people have to fax in documents, get ready, <laughs> because the millennials will build a whole new system. You know, people say to me that do legal tech startups, they say, well, you know, we want to sell to the courts, we want to sell to the law firms. It's like, that's not really the way disruption happens. Airbnb, if they were selling to Hilton and Hyatt and Marriott, they would be out of business in, you know, the first month. They built a whole new system, completely new, and they said, we think this could be better, and then more and more people used it, and now they're bigger than any of the hotel chains. So that's what can happen in the justice sector. If we don't innovate, if we don't continue to meet our parties where they are, they're going to go build their own solutions, and then it's gonna be far more disruptive because they're not gonna be interested in the legacy systems because they're gonna have their own pathways. So again, that's not to, that's, it, this can be a good thing. This is an opportunity for us to expand access to justice in a way we haven't ha been able to in the last 100 years. But it's scary too. You know, if you look at medicine, if you look at finance, those industries have been completely reinvented by technology. But those industries didn't go away. They actually got better, they got more efficient, and they got more effective. So we can do that in the legal sector as well. We just have to embrace the change instead of resist it. So. I suspect as, as, as courts go, um, they often uh, will, as we saw yesterday with a VCAD example, they will in first offer like an, a hybrid system where they, they allow parties to, to go in, in person. Um, may not be to the local courthouse, maybe to, to hearing centers. That's, that's the direction that the UK is taking at the moment. But that, we, that will obviously will be phased out in time or will be reduced. Um, sorry, I, I thought that I was good. Enthusiastic question. Oh, okay. Enthusiastic question. I just wanted to actually ask a question. Could you stand up? We, we've talked about sitting down the energy and water ombudsman. We've talked about people falling through the cracks. We're also focused on using technology to ask these questions. But no one's remembered that someone can go, hang on, it's not quite suiting me right now. And I really wanted to have one of you explore something a bit more. I just want to use it as an example how quickly people just follow that and forget that we're humans. Mm. Yeah, I'm well, sorry. <laughs> 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 Blame the moderator. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can pay the damages for insulting my <laughs> And I accept cryptocurrency. <laughs> just the value of an apology as well. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah, yeah, so right, though, that uh, at least in our very limited, you know, and we're, we're tiny and only new to this, but w people like talking to people. And we've found, uh, you know, that's our best way of getting people into the system and explain it and talk them through
That's exactly right. And I think it's the same problem that's going on now. If you go to the Melbourne courthouse, most things are there. But if you go to one of the regional courthouses, some of them don't even have security. And so, mm -hmm. so that problem is there, and it's one that has to be considered, because you can't just create self-help stations at the Melbourne Magistrates Court and leave all the regional courts or suburban courts without them. And it can't just be a computer sitting there. You need to have actual <coughs> court staff trained in assisting people uh, to enter and go through the system. So it's a very valid point, and that has to be considered, and it has to be ensured that it's done right. And for everyone, not just the people that go to the Melbourne Magistrates Court, or with ev whatever state we're talking about. A lot of those regional states are simply the ones that won't have access to technology yep. and won't be used by state with the technology or be able to deal with it. So that's, that's right. Yeah, so that, that really has to be considered. No, it's a, it's a very important point. So um, last question, if I can merge together a few that are on a similar yeah, topic, next. which are around education and culture. Um, how, how do we need to train court staff, the court staff of the future to manage this? And then uh, what about tra education and training for the public? Do we need to educate the public about what justice will look like in the digital world? Well, um, uh, what I've found is that the public have adapted really, really easily to the CRT. Um, we don't get a ton of confusion or why does this exist. Where they have a really hard time adapting is when they're thrust into a court system that looks the same as it did roughly 250 years ago. That's confusing. There's Latin, there's robes, there's all kinds of wood paneling, they're doing everything wrong. It's like being put on Mars. Um, being able to file an online form and click radio buttons is something that they do every day. So there hasn't actually been a lot of, cult the culture change, the change management work we've done, it hasn't really been with the public. It's been about educating them that this exists, but after that they're pretty much off to the races. Where the change management work had to happen is with other stakeholders, primarily legal stakeholders. And they were the ones who were much, much harder to move. When you talk, when, you be, when I meet somebody at a party or an elevator, and as you can tell, this is 90% of what I talk about, best case scenario, they're like, well, th doesn't that exist already? Well, what, of course, like, why, why not? Um, there's never any resistance. So, in, and then the second part of the question is, how do we tra then train frontline staff? Our approach is that we train them to be customer service providers. We don't train them to be administrators, primarily. Um, so we have very much sort of a call center employee approach to our frontline staff. They're here to help, they're here to solve problems, they're here to escalate where necessary, and they're there to find solutions. They're not there just to stamp things and do data entry. And so I think to the extent that we can um, have those folks do high value, human-centered work, we're going to increase their satisfaction, reduce their burnout rate, and increase the uh, accessibility to the members of the public who would be alienated by uh, having no humans involved in the process. Else? Michael, do you have a suitable animal for this? Oh, <laughs> suitable animal. I just want to say, Koala. I, I think uh, ODR, now we talk about a religion. You treat ODR like a religion. If you treat, like, for example, back to 2011, I introduced smart settle e-negotiation to our school. Um, that time, even my promise, I, I promoted ODR to the judge. They, they not uh, used it. Then I, I went to the Hangzhou and uh, asked uh, the, the online judge. I brought the ODR. What's ODR? Please show me what's ODR. That's original from uh, just what you, that kind of conference. I, I got an ODR from the ODR conference. I, 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 I saw in the ODR seat in China. So you have to show this kind of everyone treat the ODR like a religion, not like a business. So then that's the best way, I guess. And even China is uh, top top down, but still it's uh, from bottom up. And uh, first, uh, oh, it's uh, in Hangzhou, then Supreme Court recognized it, then the whole China. Uh, so that's the way that uh, they depend. So Australia, ODR, it depends on all of you. <laughs> okay. 
So I'll say one thing too. One of the great features of this conference, the way it's designed, is we have the playground outside. So uh, I don't know how my wife would feel if uh, someone told her that I came over to Australia and I'm engaging in speed dating. But uh, I do think it's a great way to go and see how intuitive these tools have become. And I think there's a lot, people sometimes when they talk about ODR in the abstract, they feel like technology is dehumanizing, it, it puts people into boxes, it, you know, it constrains people. It, uh, and that it, it can't. There is technology that's badly designed, but there's also technology that is really well designed, and it, parties get it immediately. I, I agree with Shannon. My experience is you put these tools in people's hands, and they're like, "Oh, okay, I understand this. This is very straightforward. This this is how I deal with my healthcare. This is how I deal with my banking. This is how I sign my kids up for for summer camp." You know, it's it, it's a very it, they already understand the language of these tools. We're not trying to do something really kind of whiz bang and challenging. You want people, people to feel comfortable. So um, I, I actually think the hardest challenge that I think remains for ODR is the organizational change management within court administrators, with judges, with lawyers. <clears throat> that is the biggest obstacle that we deal with. I would, you know, I think there's a saying in the US, um, I'd rather have, you know, uh, the first 100 people taken out of the phone book uh, instead of all the elected senators. They do a better job running things. <laughs> So it might be that if we just took 100 citizens off the street and we brought them in here and said, hey, how can you navigate the software? They'd be like, boom, this is great. It's really easy because they've already been trained. On that point, yeah. we <laughs> did speak to the Juries Commissioner. Where are you, Paul? Right and we actually wanted to bring in people, volunteers from the jury pool who weren't required on that day to have real people here and let them walk around with you in the playground. And you will see the difference between our skill set and how ordinary people use it. But it was a bad day. Thursday, Paul tells me, is a frosty day and there are not many jurors. <laughs> Can I just say one thing that when we talk about uh, the difficulty of using technology when going online, most people do not like or are confident going to the court presenting, representing themselves. That's a very intimidating experience. I worked with judges for about 10 years in several courts. I would still, and I'm a lawyer, but I'm not a barrister and I'm not used to being on my feet and as you learned a lot yesterday, those who saw me, I don't like talking, but um, point is, it's very difficult to present a good case in the courtroom and to understand what you're supposed to put to the judge, what's important and what is not, and what is just facts that the judge would tell you he doesn't care about and move on. So we have to remember when we, when we are questioning the online court what the current system is. It's a blank sheet of paper and you have to put it together yourself and that's difficult for many people. If I may very briefly, I think this question is, was very, very well addressed by another question, uh, the title of a book by Richard Soskin, yeah. uh, The End of Lawyers, question mark, and yeah. you know, making the point that we're educating them in the 19th century um, uh, law. And, and, and I think that uh, it is true, even universities were not teaching ADR, uh, most universities are not teaching undergraduates ADR, but I think there is now a good momentum as the courts are <laughs> embedding technology, are embedding ADR processes, I think this is about to change and about time as well. So there is a question over there as well. Hello, I had a question. I've heard uh, the term for ADR, lawyers referring to it as alarming drop in revenue. <laughs> 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 so my thought for ODR, and maybe it's the C drop in revenue, <laughs> because my concern, you, you just raised that point, is that um, there's, there's uh, I suppose, a conflict of interest almost for lawyers in that they mm. want their clients to come to them. They need it to be mysterious in order to be relied upon and you know charge all the money. So I suppose the question is, obviously working with the judges, but engaging with the legal sector in terms of ODR, what processes have been done um, globally or in your experience of helping lawyers see the value and that it's not just going to be the end of their, their business? <coughs> No, mm -hmm. you, you've heard my rant about this yesterday. <laughs> no, that's not everyone. No, you okay, so do it again. But <laughs> uh, ba I get asked that question a lot. What about the lawyers? Think of the poor lawyers. What are they gonna do? How will they make a living? And beyond the fact that that's outside of my jurisdiction, that's not gonna stop me from weighing in on this, which is that I don't think that it's our job to worry about that. I think we don't owe lawyers a, a living. I don't think the public system owes lawyers a living any more than they owe any other profession a living. <laughs> and if you are a lawyer who makes your living based on the fact that we failed as a public system 
to update our processes because those processes are so Byzantine and complex and expensive and confusing to use that you have to hire a lawyer just to figure it out and we simplify that and you don't get to do that work anymore, then you need to find different work to do. You need to assess your value proposition. <laughs> See, I'm talking to a, to a friendly crowd. That doesn't always go over so well in different audiences. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe just, I love what she just said, but I don't want to end on that note because there's <laughs> certain people that are going to leave this room going, oh no. <laughs> uh, but I will say, if we can achieve this vision of bringing many more cases into the system, then, you know, there used to be on the floor of the stock exchanges, there were people that held up pieces of paper saying, I want to buy 10,000 shares, I want to buy, and no one, those people are gone. But there are many more jobs in finance because computers are doing that now. And if we can successfully <coughs> re-envision the justice system, we built a system, a court diversion program in New York State where we do 300,000 cases a year. We dropped it from three to five years in the courts to three to five months because it's an all online process. And the lawyers were terrified. They're like, I make my money on the billable hour. But we said to them, hey, look, you're gonna be able to do many more cases. You can unbundle your services, you can charge flat rate, and you could do it from your pool side, you know? Like you're on the tablet resolving cases. You don't have to pay a paralegal to Xerox thousands of pages of things and then bill everybody. And you know, actually the lawyers that work in that area made much more money because they increased the number of cases that they could file and they said it improved the quality of life enormously. And now there's actually more lawyers in that program than there were before. So you know, I don't think that ODR has to be an uh, obscene drop in revenue. <laughs> you know? I think we can come up with a system just like we have in these other areas where technology has disrupted it. We need more people, but th they're gonna have to change the way they do things, and that's scary. But let's, let's provide a path, a gilded path to that future that's not so terrifying for them. Yeah. But I still love what Janet said. <laughs> um, uh, uh, American professor uh, asked me a question. So the internet uh, need a lawyer, but I, because I'm not a prim primary source, then I back to the uh, internet court judges. They said, uh, uh, still need lawyers. And they, that's what you said. Just like uh, China have the big, uh, Beijing have the metro, right? The more, the more metro increase the tax drivers. Just what you said. Metrolink incre increase the taxes, tax, cap, tax, tax, T A X I, taxis, 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 not a tax, mm -hmm. <laughs> straight face, uh, taxis, <laughs> yeah, uh, in increase it, yeah, Metrolink, not a reduce it, same way, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, we unfortunately have to end now. We could easily do this all day, and it would be a lot of fun and very interesting, um, but there's a lot of other program to come. But can I just ask you to thank our fantastic panelists? Thank you.